Thanks for tuning in to Dream City Omaha Online. Connect further with us by downloading the Dream City Omaha app or finding us on Facebook and Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe for more. As we have read through the story of King David, and, and for those of you that maybe are with us for the first time, we've been reading through the Bible chronologically together from the beginning of the year. And we've read through the, the, the story of King David, and we see that as a young man, he's anointed as king. He kills Goliath. Saul, who was king at the time, first king in Israel's history, gets jealous, makes it his mission to kill David. David is running and hiding. And as David is, is in hiding, we, we see that there's, there's men that come alongside of David. We see that there's a group of men, and when he's in the cave, that, that gather with David. And the Bible tells us that these are the men who are in debt. These are the men who are distressed. These are the men who are depressed. These are the men who have a bone to put pick with, with family or society. It's something going on. A couple weeks ago, I told you this was like, like David's island of misfit toys. That all the people that, that nobody wanted were the people that David found himself surrounded by. And it, it wasn't just a one-time event. Like It's not like David just one day woke up and there were men there. Everywhere David went, there were more men who were wanting to join the cause. And as David found himself surrounded literally by an army at this point, he, he found within that group of men, without, within that army of men, 30 of the mightiest, 30 of the most loyal, 30 of the bravest warriors in the group. And then within that 30, he found three. Who does that sound like? Sounds like Jesus, because when Jesus came, he had many people who would follow him, but he chose 12 to be close to him. And then within the 12, he chose three to really be intimate with. We see that in David because David, the Bible tells us, has this army, but within the army, he has 30 mighty men. But within the 30, he also has three that are the bravest. They are the strongest. They are the most loyal. And, and as David is, is choosing these men to be around him, we have to understand that David was selective. Not just anybody could be a member of the three. Not just anybody could be one of the 30 of David's mighty men. See, David was selective in who he surrounded himself with. This morning, I want to, I want to ask you, and really encourage you to this week begin to evaluate and ask yourself the question, who do I surround myself with? Young person, who are you surrounding yourself with? Are you surrounding yourself with people who will push you towards God or pull you away from him? Sir, who are you surrounded by? Are you surrounding yourself with men who will sharpen you or men who will make you more dull? Ladies, who are you surrounded by? Women who will make you better or women who will make you bitter? See, we all have to be selective with who we surround ourselves by. Sometimes we look around and, and maybe we don't feel like David with his 30 mighty men. Maybe we feel like David in the cave with a bunch of misfits. Right? We look around and we, we, we start looking at the people that we're close to and that, that are around us. And it's like, man, I wish I could change this about you. And I wish I could change this about you. And I wish I didn't have to put up with this in you. And we can, we can pick out the faults in everybody else because how you know everyone you surround yourself with, there are things that you have to put up with. But so often it's easy for us to, to think about putting up with their stuff. But did you ever stop to think that the people that are surrounded by you have to put up with your stuff too? Like if, if we all, if there's things in all, if we all have people that, that have things we have to put up with, then we have to recognize we are people too. And we have things that people put up with in us. Yeah. But have you ever looked around and wished that you could just change the people that you're surrounded by? Like, I wish you were different. I wish I could change this about you. I wish you didn't do this. I wish you didn't have that habit. I wish you didn't have this tendency. I wish you wouldn't respond like this. When we start evaluating our friends, there's, there's always things that we wish we could change. You know what I've learned? Here's what I learned. I want to I I give this to you today. I've learned that you can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. 
You can't change them as people. You can pray for them and pray that the Holy Spirit would work in them and that the fruit of the Spirit would begin to be produced in their hearts and in their lives. You can't change them, but you can change them. You can start looking for new people to surround yourself with. If the people that are around you are not pushing you in the direction that you want to go in life, and if they're not helping you become who God has created you to be, stop trying to change them and just change them. Stop trying to make them different and start finding different people. Today, I want to... to challenge us in who we surround ourselves with. And I want to give you four things. As, we, as we've read this week the story of King David, as we read how, how he has selected these people and the, the character of the people that he surrounded himself with, I want to give you four things that you can take with you this week and use to evaluate who you're surrounding yourself with. Because we all need friends. And the first thing that we have to understand today is we all need friends that will fight with us. You need friends that will fight with you. You need friends that will fight for you. You need friends that that when it's time to go into battle, you know who to call. We just read it, 1 Chronicles chapter 11. It it tells us that that of those three, there was one. And as the army fled, Eleazar and David held their ground. They held their ground in the middle of the battle, the two of them together. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes that two is better than one because if one falls down, the other can pick them up that they can stand back to back in a battle. They can keep each other warm. Who are those people that when it's time to go into battle, you know that you can call on? Everybody else fled. Everybody else ran away. Have you ever been there? You ever been in a season of your life where where things aren't going according to plan? It seems like, like everything that could go wrong has gone wrong, that Murphy's Law is running amok in your life. And you look around at the people who should be behind you and should be around you, and they're nowhere to be found. Like Moses on top of the mountain, we have our arms raised, but we don't have Aaron and we don't have her to lift us when we get tired, when we get fatigued. Who are the people that have you're back. I remember growing up in Albuquerque. I remember in school, it felt like there was a fight every other day. And, and this was only middle school. But it felt like every other day there was a fight at lunch or there was a fight after school. And, and it was always the same. It was two guys, sometimes two girls, that would show up And there would be this circle of people around them and and behind one individual was their friends. And then behind the other individual was their friends. It was kind of like the music video for Michael Jackson's Beat It. You remember that music video where they tied their arms together and they have a knife and they're, they're like almost dance knife fighting kind of. But I remember it was like that in and they would, they would start fighting and eventually one would start winning. And as one, one group of friends saw their friends starting to lose the fight, they would jump into the fight. Well, and as they jumped into the fight, then the other group of friends had to jump into the fight as well. And because of that, there were certain people that you knew you just didn't mess with. Not because they were the biggest and not because they were the strongest and not because they were the best fighters but because of the people that they surrounded themselves with. And if you had a friend who was trying to start a fight with that person, you told them like, listen, you better stop it because if you show up to that fight, I don't have your back. Have you seen his friends? Have you seen the size of them? I want no part of that. And in our lives, when we go into a spiritual fight, now I'm not telling you to, to hang out with big people in case somebody cuts you at the Walmart self checkout line. Like, that's not what I'm saying. That's not, I'm not talking about physically fighting people here, okay? Like, this, we're not going to turn Dream City into Fight Club. That's not what we're talking about. But what we are talking about is those spiritual battles that you and I face around every other corner. And in those times, who are the people that you can call that you know will pray with you? that you know will pray for you, that you know will will have faith with you and stand in the gap with you? Who are the people that that you can turn to when when things aren't going so well? Who is is your friend? 
that you can stand in the middle of a field with knowing that even though the enemy is attacking us from every other side, we will stand our ground. And as we do, the Lord will see us through to victory. Do you have people that will fight with you? The second, the second type of friend that we need is not only do we need friends that will fight with us, we need friends that will celebrate with us. We need some people that will come, come alongside us and throw a party every now and then. Because there is a time for fighting and there is those battles that we go through, but then there's also breakthroughs that we experience and we just need somebody to encourage us in that. They were on their way to make David king. We're gonna go back to God's word and, and here's what it says. I love this. It says, it says, all these men, all David's men, all these warriors came in their battle array, dressed in battle with the single purpose of making David king over all Israel. In fact, everyone in Israel agreed that David should be their king. They fasted and, or they, excuse me, they feasted. They didn't fast, they feasted. It's the opposite of fasting. They feasted and drank with David for three days for preparations had been made by their relatives for their arrival. And people from as far away as Issachar, Zebulun, Naphtali, they brought food on donkeys, camels, mules, and oxen. Look at the food that they brought. Vast supplies of flour, fig cakes, clusters, raisins, wine, olive oil, cattle, sheep, goats were brought to the celebration. There was great joy throughout the land. His warriors came and not only did his warriors came, their families came, and not only did their families came, but their families came with the intent of celebrating and throwing this party because David is our king. Find you some friends that will load up their camels with some fig cakes. Right? Like, like, who's that friend that when you want to throw a party, it's like, hey, grab some olive oil and your oxen and get over here right away because you're not going to believe what happened. I got this promotion at work. It's time for us to feast for three days. Come on, somebody. I would just want to be your friend so that I can feast with you for three days. But we all need, we all need those people. Not, not, not like, not obviously, not literally. Can you imagine if you threw a birthday party and a friend showed up with a goat? <laughs> Who's that guy? We were watching Parks and Rec this week. I don't know if you've ever seen this, this TV show, Parks and Rec, but we were watching Parks and Rec and there's a character on there called Ron Swanson and Ron shows up to a barbecue and, and he's responsible for barbecuing. He shows up with a pig on a leash and he starts introducing everybody to Tom, the pig, who was going to be their barbecue. And everybody freaked out like, Ron, you can't do that. I'm not saying like literal, I'm not saying be Ron Swanson, like show up to parties with goats and and pigs, but find somebody that can celebrate with you. Find somebody that, that will encourage you. Find somebody that rejoices when you rejoice. See, times we go into spiritual battle and we need friends that are willing to fight. And there's times where we experience breakthrough and we need people to encourage us. Here's what I want you to understand. It's okay if your fighting friends are not your party friends. It's okay if your warrior friends are there for you when you're doing battle in the spirit. And then you have another group of people that when it's time to party, it's time to party. Because there are people who will fight and there are people who will go to war, but they're not naturally gifted with the gift of encouragement. They don't have that ability. Now, now it's okay. I want, to, I want to free you up in that. But at the same time, I also want you to be aware that if you're somebody's fighting friend and they don't call you to go to the party, that's okay too. We all need different people around us that serve different purposes for different reasons, for different seasons in our lives. Sometimes we just need people that are willing to celebrate, to throw a party for us. We need friends to fight. We need friends to encourage. See, we, we need good friends. Talk to too many people who the, the, not the complaint, but the issue that they have in their lives comes down to they don't have those friends. Trying to do it alone. Like those unsung heroes, we, David couldn't have done it by himself. David couldn't have done it without 
his friends. He couldn't have done it without the 30. He couldn't have done it without the three. He couldn't have done it without the island of misfit toys. He needed, he needed all of them. We all need people in our lives. We need friends to fight. We need friends to, to celebrate. We need good friends. But as you start looking and evaluating your friends, I also want you to be aware that it's not enough just to find good friends. We also have to find godly friends. Because there's a difference between good friends and godly friends. Not every good friend is a godly friend, and not every godly friend is a good friend. You need, you need both. David becomes king, and they, they celebrate. David, one day, he, he says, you know what? We, we need to bring the Ark of the Covenant back. We've neglected it for too long. It's time for us to bring it back. And, and we find that story in 1 Chronicles. David, he consults with his friends. He, he consults with his officials, his generals, the captains of his army. Verse 3, he says, It's time to bring back the ark of our God, for we've neglected it during the reign of Saul. See, the Philistines had come down prior to David becoming king, prior to Saul becoming king, and they had captured the ark. They took it back into Philistine territory, but God sent a curse upon them, so they put it on some donkeys and said, get it out of here. The ark comes back to Israel, and, and as, as the, the ark is taken back into Israel, a group of men, they, they take the, the ark off of the card, and it says that some of them open it and look inside. Apparently, they had never seen raiders of the lost ark because 70 of them died. If they, if they had seen Indiana Jones, they would have known to close their eyes that something bad was going to happen, but it kills 70 of them. They don't know what to do with it, so they, they put it in the house of a, of a man named Abinadab, and that's where the ark has been. Now, David becomes king and says, that's not right. We need to get the ark back. We need to bring it we need to bring it back. So what does he do? He consults with his generals, his captains, his army, his, his, his closest advisors, and he says, we're going to do this. So they go down. They, they get the ark, they put it on a cart, they're bringing it back to Jerusalem. And, and as they're bringing it back, one of the oxen pulling the cart stumbles and, and falls. And as he stumbles, the ark and the cart becomes uh, unstable and the ark starts to fall off of the cart. And a man named Uzzah reaches out his hand with the sole purpose of saving the ark from falling yet because he didn't go about it the right way because he wasn't a Levite, because he wasn't purified to come into contact with the sacred things. Remember, we read that in Leviticus. God strikes him and he dies on the spot. David is upset. He's frustrated. He's mad. How am I going to get the ark back now? I don't know what to do with it. They put it in the house of a man named Obed-Edom. It's in his house. He's being blessed because God's presence is in his house. Some time passes and, and David is given a new piece of information. And the piece of information is this, David, when you tried to bring back the ark the first time, you did it wrong. Because not just anybody can touch the ark. Not just anybody can carry the ark. When the children of Israel moved through the desert, who was it that carried the ark? The Levites. It was the priests. It was the descendants of Aaron, God gave Moses very clear instructions on how to transport the ark, on how to move the ark. And David, he consults his generals and he consults his army and he consults his captains and says, hey, fellas, we're going to do this. And they try and do a good thing in a, in a wrong way. Have you ever done that? Yeah. You, ever tried to, <laughs> you ever tried to accomplish a good thing outside of the will of God? Doesn't usually work out well, does it? Doesn't end up how we, how we had it going in our head. In my mind, that worked out so much differently. And I'm sure David was in that position. In my, in my head, this was going to be a glorious thing. Now somebody is dead, and I don't know what to do. Some time passes, he's given this information, and finally he's able to do it right. He, he calls the Levites together, and he says to them, you are the leaders of the Levite families. You must purify yourselves all your fellow Levites, so you can bring the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place that I have prepared for it. He says, because you didn't carry it the first time, the anger of God burst out. We failed to ask God how to move it properly. We were trying to do a good thing in an ungodly way. See, David was surrounded by good people, and he asked good people, what should I do? And it wasn't until somebody with 
godly understanding showed up and said, David, no, this is the way that you need to do it, was David able to carry out what was in his heart to do? See, there's a difference between good friends and godly friends. Be careful who you take advice from. Because a good friend will tell you what seems right to them, but a godly friend will tell you what's right to God. A good friend will visit you in the hospital, but a godly friend will pray for you. A good friend will tell you to do what makes you happy. And a godly friend will remind you that true joy only comes from the Lord. A good friend will tell you to follow your heart, but a godly friend knows that your heart is deceitfully wicked. See, we need to evaluate the people around us. Do we just have good people around us or do we have godly people around us? I think some of us, the problem is we, we surround ourselves with too many red flag people. Right? Like there's things in their lives that from the beginning, like that's a red flag. But you can hang out. That's a red flag, but we have fun together. That's a red flag, but you make me feel good about myself. That's a red flag, but... And we make up all of these excuses for, for why we allow red flag people to, to hang around us, right? We allow selfish people and angry people and abusive people and controlling people. Well, no, it's not that. He just, he just knows what he wants. No, what he wants is to control and manipulate. Well, no, they're not bad kids. No, what they want is to, to keep you from going where God wants you to be, whether they know it or not. That's what's happening. Well, no, it's just, it's just, it's just. And so many times we make excuses. I know he doesn't know Jesus, but do you know how hard it is to meet people today? Red flag. Here's what I want to encourage you with today. Stop trying to repaint red flags yellow. When you see a red flag in somebody else, somebody around you, don't try and paint it yellow recognize it for what it is. That's a red flag. I need to be aware of that. I should distance myself. I should be careful. I should establish healthy boundaries. I should, I should be aware and, and, and careful of how close I let that person get to me. Because if there's too many red flags, you know whose flags those end up becoming? Yours. Now it's not just their red flag, but that red flag is, is a part of who you are. And it's a part of your life. I used to hate when my parents would tell me growing up, show me who your friends are. And I'll show you who you be. Thank you, mom. Happy Mother's Day. You were right. I was wrong. What else, anything else? Would always tell me, show me who your friends are. I'll show you who you'll become. But it's true. Those that you allow around you, you have to be aware of. Not just in somebody else, but listen. Some of you have to stop trying to repaint your red flags yellow. And if somebody that's close to you comes to you and says, hey, here's what I've noticed. Here's what I've seen in you. You have a tendency to respond with anger. You have a, you have a tendency to do this. You have, you have some habits in you that, that if you really want to get where God is taking you, you're going to have to learn to break. And when somebody comes to us with that, be willing to recognize it for what it is and don't say, well, if you look at it in the right light, it's not a red flag, it's more like, a, it's more like an orangish flag. Well, if you look at it this way, because the way that I see it, it's not red, the way I see it is orange. Stop trying to justify and repaint your flags or the flags of people around you. Don't be content to just find good friends but make it a priority to find godly friends as well. And then finally, the, the fourth thing is this. Find friends that will challenge you. So David has friends that will fight. David has friends that will celebrate. David has friends that will give him godly advice. David also allows people around him who will challenge him when he's wrong. Right, David, he has this idea and he builds this palace for himself. And as he builds this palace, he looks out and the ark is under this, this tent. He says, this isn't right. If I have this palace and, and God's presence is housed in just a tent, I want to make this house for God. And so he calls Nathan, 
the prophet to him and he tells Nathan, go and put that scripture up. He tells Nathan his plan. He says, look, I'm living in a cedar palace. The ark is, is out there under a tent. And Nathan's response is, okay, do whatever you have in your heart. Do whatever is in your mind to do. God is with you, David. He's anointed you to be king. Go for it. Nathan leaves. God comes to him that night and says, no, tell David, this isn't what I want. Tell David, I don't want him to build me a house. Tell David, it's not for him to build me a house. I've never had a house. I've always, I've always gone where you were and I was your God in your midst. And whether it was a tent or not, like, like I don't need a house, David. But in fact, I don't want you to build me a house, but I'm going to build you a house. And I'm going to establish a line of kings through you, David. And, and one day from this line of kings will come one whose kingdom will reign forever. And we know that that is Jesus. So he goes to, God comes to Nathan and Nathan goes back to David and he tells David all the things that God says. So David's like, okay, God, I won't do that. See, David had in his mind something to do, was willing and okay being challenged by somebody else. And he was he was okay with that. See, see, later as we continue to read in our chronological plan, we'll come across kings in Israel's history where they weren't, they weren't okay with that. Where not only did they not want the prophets to come and challenge them, but they did everything that they could to kill all of God's prophets. Because I don't want you to come and tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. I don't want you to challenge my thinking. I just want to do what's in my head to do. I want to do what's in my heart to do. But we have to, to be willing to have people that will challenge us. And this isn't the only time, spoiler alert. This isn't the only time Nathan will challenge David. But this week in our reading, it's going to get real scandalous. Like for real. David takes another woman as his wife. Kills her husband. I know, I told him, spoiler alert. If you don't want to hear it, close your ears. Kills her husband, takes her as his wife. She's pregnant. Nobody knows. David thinks he's got away with it. Nathan shows up to the palace one day and he tells David this story. He says, David, he says, there's two guys, rich guy and a poor guy. This rich guy's got all kinds of lamb. He's got all kinds of sheep, all kinds of livestock. This poor guy, he only has one little lamb. So then this little lamb is like a family member to him. It, it eats at the dinner table. It hangs out with the kids. It sleeps in his bed. Like this is essentially like one of, he treats it as one of his kids. It's the only lamb he has. One day the rich man has a friend come into town and, and rather than killing one of his flock, he goes over and he takes the poor man's one lamb and he kills it and he serves it to his friend. What do you think should happen, David? David's outraged can't believe it. This is so wrong. This man deserves to die. That's what David says. This man deserves to die. And the prophet Nathan has one of the all-time greatest mic drop moments in biblical history. As he looks at David and he says, David, you're that man. David, you're that man. And what's David's response? As David, the king of all Israel, as David, the one who has slain Goliath and he's killed giants and he's defeated countless numbers of armies, he's expanded Israel's territory. What's David's response? To fall and repent. Because he was willing to be challenged, because he was okay finding people that would challenge the way that he thinks. Who do you have in your life that can tell you that you're wrong? Who do you have in your life that can challenge the way that you think? Men, if you're married and your wife comes to you with something that's challenging, your first response should not be to brush it off and say, you don't understand. You don't know what you're talking about. Mind your own business. Your first response should be to take that issue to God in prayer and say, God, is there any truth to this? Yeah. God, is this, is, this, is this really something that I need to address in my life? God, is this just a misunderstanding or is this a red flag in me that I need to work on? Ladies, when, when something's going on, don't go to that friend who you know will see it the way that you see it for advice. 
Well, I'm going to go talk to so-and-so because I know they're going to tell me what I want to hear and they're going to understand what I'm talking about. And they, they see things the same way that I see things. Are you okay finding people and surrounding yourself with people that don't see things the way you see things? Who you've given the freedom and the, the, the permission to, to tell you when you're wrong? Sir, do you have those people? And I know it, it's not easy. Nobody wants to to hear you're wrong. Nobody wants those things pointed out in them. But what we have to understand is if we are really going to be the people that God has called us and created us to be, if we are really going to be the church in this community that serves as a light in a dark place and hope for the hopeless and where people can come in and experience the love of God that they've never experienced before. If we are going to be those people, then we need to surround ourselves with people who will help us get to the place of being those people. Thank you for the two people that agree with that. The rest of you must just be so convicted right now that you can't even verbalize. Who do you allow close to you? Who are you surrounding yourself with? See, we all need friends that will fight with us. We all need friends that will encourage us. We all need friends that will give us godly wisdom and godly advice and point us back to God. We need we need good friends. We need godly friends. We need friends that will challenge. This morning, we all need those friends. The Bible says that there is, there is one friend who sticks closer than a brother. There's one friend who will never fail us, who will never leave us, who will never forsake us. For those of you that are here, it's like, I don't have friends. You have access to a friend today. That friend who will never leave, his name is Jesus. 2,000 years ago, he stepped out of heaven and he put on flesh and he came to this earth to live a perfect life so that he could shed his blood and allow his body to be broken for you, to redeem you and to ransom you, to give you an opportunity to have personal, intimate relationship with your heavenly father. Today, if you don't know that friend, I want to give you an opportunity. If you would just bow your heads, close your eyes. Those of you online, you can pray with me right wherever you're at. Driving down the road, it doesn't matter. Just keep your eyes open if you're praying. This morning, the Bible says that if we would just call upon the name of the Lord, that we would be saved. And that promise is for everyone and anyone. That if we would believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, that Jesus is Lord, that God raised him from the dead, that our names would be written into the book of life and we would experience newness of life in him. This morning, if, if you need to ask Jesus into your life, if you need to surrender yourself to him, you wanna be introduced to the friend that sticks closer than a brother, would you just pray this prayer with me? Just say, Jesus, thank you so much for being my friend, for paying the price and making the ultimate sacrifice, showing outrageous love. And today I surrender my life, my past, my future, all of me, 100% to you. Would you change me, put me on a new path and lead me in your way? I receive you as my savior and I submit to you as Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, today for those of us that as we go this week, we're encouraged by your word, but we're challenged by your word and we start, start looking at our mighty warriors. We start looking at our 30, the people that we surround ourselves with. Lord, help us as we go to find those that that are able to fight with us. Find those that 
that can celebrate with us. Find those that are not just good friends, but godly friends and help us to humble ourselves, to be willing to to give permission to those that would challenge us. God, if there's anyone that we're surrounded by that we've been trying to change for too long, that maybe we just need to change, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal that to us as well. That there would be boundaries established and healthy relationship moving forward. But God, that we wouldn't waste any more energy trying to change when you're calling us to change that we would stop trying to repaint red flags in others or in ourselves as yellow. God, I just pray that you would lead us in the fullness of your wisdom in every relationship from this day forward. As we submit ourselves to you, we love you, we thank you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Now, before we end the stream and before you stand up, I do want to like, Disclaimer, if you're here and you are in a covenant relationship, family, marriage, the whole like, don't change, but change, that's not for you, okay? So if you're here like, I've been trying to change my husband, I just need to change my husband, that's not what I'm saying. (laughs) Just so we're aware, we're all on the same page moving forward. That specific word was not for that specific relationship. Other than that, I love you guys. Hey, moms, on your way out, we've got a couple photo booth opportunities. Would encourage you stop by, take a picture with your family, your friends. And then the tables out front, those coffee mugs, those are for the moms today. So mom, go ahead and stop by, grab yourself a a coffee mug. Be blessed today. We honor you. We love you. Thank you for all that you do in our lives. One more time for all of our moms. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Love you. At Dream City Omaha, we're all about helping each other do three things. Discover Christ, recover identity, and uncover purpose. Please check out our past sermon series or online discipleship classes. And don't forget to hit subscribe and the bell for notifications on all of our latest videos.